Hi, this is test for the AAH conference um, video and presentation. This is test one. I'm just going to share my screen. Okay. Hi, I'm Susan Merrick, um, artist and sign language interpreter and serial collaborator. I make socially engaged art. I work in communities and with other artists. I focus on women's lives, experiences, and I have conversations. I work with performance, action, and cameras. I'm a feminist. I'm Northern, and I'm working class. But I now live what is considered a middle-class life, which happens to some of us almost automatically when you do certain things in your life, like go to uni, buy a house, or heaven forbid, call yourself an artist. But it's also an identity which never quite fits you comfortably. So you live in between, no longer considered working class by economic status. But if sitting within an industry that's so traditionally middle class, uh, like the art world, you carry all the shame, stigma, difference, and many of the barriers from being working class with you. When I met Felicity last year to talk about the deservra, I had to first look up what an oeuvre was. I'd never heard the term and it also turned out that I had no idea how to pronounce it or spell it. Thank you for helping me there, Felicity. For many people, the art world remains inaccessible, a strange world with its own language, script, rules of engagement, and what appears to be an exclusive guest list and an exhausting amount of barriers. No one that I knew became an artist and no one as far as I knew went to galleries or art spaces. They were not for me, they were for rich people with a posh education who didn't need to get a proper job. In this presentation, I want to share some examples of how women artists have been accessing or navigating the art world for decades by doing it differently to the perceived dominant culture and how recognizing these different ways of working and disseminating them is essential in providing access to working class women as both artists and audiences. I want to draw on my own experience of entering the art world at 35, after years of working as a support worker and then sign language interpreter, having kids, and how I found that the only way I could work within the art world was to do it differently, to what I perceived was the dominant art world pathway. I've chosen to use my personal experience and background, not only because this is vital to the concept of the deservra that we're the conveners are presenting, but also because other working class artists and writers have found this a necessary step in sharing working class narratives, which are often not visible within artistic research or practice. As well as my own experience, I'll also mention some of the women artists who I've interviewed over the past three years in the podcast Woman Up that I host and curate with Amy Dignam and Procreate Project, also in association with the Women's Art Library. I argue that for women, especially those who don't or can't fit the mould of traditional artists, whether that be because of race, class, disability and or caring responsibilities, to enter and have a practice in the art world, we have to do things differently. We have to write our own script, our own rules, run our own schedules and most importantly, support one another rather than compete. Ultimately, we need to continue to challenge and change our art world into something new. This presentation is about access. So a colleague of mine, Jill Kennedy McNeil, suggested I start by sharing the receipt for the ticket that I had to buy to be here to talk to you today. So access, why am I here talking to you? Well, because of my experience um, in the art world, entering the art world and how I'm doing things a little differently in order to be able to work as an artist. It's really important to acknowledge the privilege, things that are seen to have had a positive or middle-class impact on me. I have had in my life, uh, the, the privilege I've had in my life and continue to have. So I'll try and remember to hold up this sign when I recognize this. So to begin with, I'm white. I'm 41 and entered the art world in my thirties, initially as a self-taught artist. I consider myself a queer feminist and this frames my artistic methodology in terms of how I try and set up my practice and constantly reflect upon it and challenge myself as well as how I read work and how I read the social and political spheres that my work explores. I'm trying to be transparent where possible and admit when I do not know something in order to learn. So with this in mind, I want to say to you now that being here at the AAH conference with all of you academics is frankly terrifying. If anyone starts talking to me about Rancière text or psychoanalysis, um, I will start sweating. So I'll just change from this confident photo to this one. 
So my home life growing up was safe and happy. We had very little money, but we managed with very low costs, no heating except a fire, rented electrical equipment and case catalogue for anything we needed to buy. My mum had a run of steady um, jobs, low paid, part time jobs, and my dad had a state pension. My mum was a lay preacher as well, so I was taught how to interact with people well through church. I was taught public speaking there too. My parents had a poor education, really, on li very little cultural capital, but I had a mixture of friends as a teenager and an auntie who paid for me to do dancing. As a teen, I hung out with ravers and party goers, people surviving in the benefit system, as well as middle class people with teachers, GPs or bank managers as parents in our state school. And this mixture of people that I met meant I had a more varied access to culture than my own family offered at that time. Access to a lot of different people, as well as still living at home at 17. I did have choices. I went to sixth form college alongside working. I did the one A-level suggested to me, sociology, alongside the new GMVQ health and social care qualification that had come out that year. Kind of meandered through school, through the pitfalls of teenage years in a recession affected North, with little to do except hang around, uh, go to raves. Most teachers had no faith in my abilities um, and until I found sociology, to be honest, neither did I. Again, uni was not in my plan. There was no plan except that I would need to expand my part-time jobs into full-time ones when I left school. It was only when my then boyfriend, when I was 16, suggested I get pregnant and we get engaged to get a house. I realised I didn't want that path. So I thought maybe I could go to uni and choose a different route. And I learned that the new student loan scheme would allow me to do this. I applied to Durham a collegiate university, something I knew absolutely nothing about. I just applied there as it was near another new boyfriend. And after two interviews, I got in. My family were gobsmacked that I was going to uni and proud. But the main question my dad had was, what will you do after and will it get you a proper job? I spent time at uni having to adjust to a whole new world, being called stupid, ugly, loud, embarrassing, and even being spat at once. Because of my accent and lesser education stood out as well as my indifference and ignorance of expected social norms and behavior at that particular uni, I was a 90s ladette and proud. It didn't really fit in. So skip forward to my 20s. I got a job as a support worker with the RNID. Did you need that degree for that? Asked Dad. And then trained to become a sign language interpreter. I had become socially mobile as had my then husband, who was uh, from an, as had my now husband, who was from an army family and trained to become an accountant. My accent wasn't as strong, so people down south could understand me when I was interpreting, and I didn't mention my raver days much. I was code switching. Art had not played a part in my life at all, past my GCSEs. I was interested in women's rights and also the Equality Act, working within the deaf community but I did not understand what contemporary art was or how on earth it would ever be relevant to the social issues that surrounded me. I thought it was maybe something to do with a weird messy bed or a shark in a tank, being weird for weird sake. In my late twenties, I had children and I also spent a lot of time with my cousin who grew up on a large council housing estate in Bradford. She'd begun painting and was doing in her thirties, her first degree in art, balancing being a single mum on benefits with her studies and volunteer work experience. She had found out through the Bob Ross programme on Sky. I followed suit and began painting using her old materials. When I was 30 and she was 39, she died of lung cancer just before she managed to officially graduate. She, like most of the other women in my family, had faced abuse as well as financial hardship throughout her life. This had a huge impact on my focus and still does. I realised that my passion for women's rights was as strong as ever, was painting labouring women, making cartoons for the AIMS Association about lack of rights and women and voice that women have within healthcare. And it was this combination and a neighbour who was working as a tech at the UCA led me to applying to doing an MA in fine art at UCA Farnham and getting in. I was a 35 year old working class northerner mum and I was going to art school. I realized very quickly during my MA that the work I did, all within a feminist framework, 
my lack of official art experience and historical knowledge and my responsibilities of other work and kids meant that none of the opportunities advertised for student or graduate artists would fit me. Even if I was ever selected, I wouldn't manage financially or in terms of the hours expected. So I decided to try and design and fund my own project with my own hours and rules. I decided on location. I decided which partners to work with. Um, artists who needed similar flexibilities and who shared ideas of working differently. Again, I had privilege. I'd done a self-funded MA, working throughout, taking on extra after-school art club jobs to pay for the fees and studying part-time. My partner was also employed. And when I applied for funding, I was able to use my English skills from interpreting and my sociological experience to understand and complete the application form, which is one of the barriers many people fall out immediately. Have you tried the granting form for ACE? Really, really difficult. I was 36 at this point and had plenty of experience to draw from in which to plan, budget and manage a project. All of this takes time, confidence, support, resources, including educational and cultural resources, um, which so many people from working class backgrounds just don't have access to. And now I've been successful in gaining five grants from Arts Council England. In my work, I wanted to hear from women, but not only via academic texts or those who were already in the art world, because as I've already said, access to them can be limited if you rely on uni reading lists or dominant art world culture, gar culture or galleries. I wanted to hear experiences of women who may or may not know about the art world, women who like me or not, may not have had access to art. And to be honest, who like most of my family and friends didn't really get it. I wanted to combine these two worlds that I was now a part of. I've worked with women artists, as well as women in prisons, women in domestic violence, refugees, who'd had similar experiences to my grandmother, mum and aunts. I also work with deaf women survivors. The work outside of my art, or before I called myself an artist, heavily influenced and influences, continues to influence my work and thinking. My work within sociology, within maternity activism, and my 18 years of work in the deaf community has focused my work on access, language, and power. Who gets heard? Who does not? I did the MA about 10 minutes from where I live. I was so frustrated throughout the two years that there was such a disconnect between the fancy art town of Far um, and uni of Farnham versus where I live in Aldershot, three miles away, a working class army town. So through all my projects, I've made a point of working locally, at least some of the time, because if I only worked within the middle class bubble of uni or where the galleries are, then I would be perpetuating the issue. I look at collaborations, collective ownership, exploring that and how hard it is when people are very new to the art world. I work with community, community facilitators like Candice Camacho seen here with me, local people who mediate between artists and non-artists. I often act as a mediator too, but also need reminding at times that I too have entered the art world, um, which means I've got my own privilege and I have to make my own knowledge assumptions when talking with non-artists, while still also feeling inadequate in terms of my historical art knowledge, artistic vocabulary and theoretical debating skills when with other artists. Again, kind of in between. Women artists, especially who are not middle class or who are not white, not able-bodied, have been doing it differently for decades. Do we historically and consistently talk about the different ways of practicing that there are, that feminist artists have been doing and have taught us, and the economic, cultural, as well as social or political reasons for doing it differently? How often do these issues get discussed within art education with a focus on class? How many art students are taught about working other jobs alongside a practice? and how that can benefit the practice as well as often being financially necessary for so many people. How often is this kind of practice shown or made clear in galleries, exhibitions and institutions so that audiences can see themselves represented? Maybe you're all talking about it all of the time. And I just don't know because I'm not a part of the academic sphere. We, as feminist artists and historians, know there is a plethora of work and artists out there. But then why are there still so relatively few writings about class with relation to art and the work that explores it? There are writers talking about it all the time. And I just don't know maybe because, I don't know, 
there are writers attempting to challenge this, sorry. Francis Hatherley asks us to consider the work of Jo Spence, uh, among others in her book, Class Slippers and in her PhD from 2019. She discusses the impact the image of the working class woman has had on and within the art world and the labor of talking about class, its unmentionableness. She focuses on the idea of grotesque and sublime and how we all have been taught to view women, working class women, whether we're working class or not. Her concept of the anti-Pygmalion is powerful and asks us to reconsider how we look at women, working class women in and out of art with a wider lens not just with the dominant middle-class lens. Stefan Schelken publishes books around themes of class, shame, and perpetuation of ignoring class difference, and how this has had such a negative impact on audiences and artists. Sabrina Mafuz recently edited the book, Smashing It, a discussion of life and art from working class artists, and also as a guide for those thinking of entering the art world and who are working class. There are other recent examples we can look to for hope as well. I've been following the work of Lauren Craig, Jane Mons Jade Montserrat and Jackie Tan, who are all challenging institutional structures within the art world in terms of race, relational and contractual structures of power and language and notions of care. In 2019, Amy Dignam and I began interviewing women for our DIY podcast, Woman Up. Through these interviews, I've spoken to fantastic women, some of whose work either explores class or class issues, but also some of whom have just learned to work differently and talked about this to me. Here pictured is Zareda Lopez and Leslie Deshler Kanesi, uh, who created Women Picturing Revolution in the US. They wanted to research and find artists who are lens-based artists. And they ask, who are the women documenting conflict in private realms and public spaces? They're particularly interested in work that uses social media to bear witness or connect people displaced by violence. They ask, what are the long terms of trauma? What does it, what the long-term effects of trauma? What does it look like when women tell these stories on their own terms? Women whose work's not usually exhibited so that they can share this work with the art and photography world who often believe the work simply does not exist. How many times do we hear galleries and institutions saying, well, there just isn't enough work available to show by women artists or black artists? Nydia Blass's work, focuses on class, race, and her series. And also her series, The Girls Who Spun Gold, uh, focuses on young black teens and mothers in the US. Having herself experienced teenage motherhood, she wanted to connect with young women who she recognized and who could recognize themselves in her work. She works as a support worker with these young women and then brings her photography into this work. We seek reflections of our own lives or to seek understanding of others. So we must see our lives, images and experiences reflected. So we must not only have the same experiences, images and perspectives shown to us. I spoke with and met Jodie Hawkes, whose work Playing Kate looks at both maternal performance as well as class and class shame, juxtaposing her own pregnancy, birth and experiences of playing motherhood with those of Kate Middleton and her family. Jo Jodie lectures in performance and fits her own practice in and around her work constantly. Her work makes clear the combination of art practice and family life and the performances we play and how each feeds the other. Sue Richardson and Shirley Cameron, who's pictured here, both spoke to me about their efforts to try and fit into and break into the art world in the 70s and their failure to do so in a traditional sense at the time, how they found their own paths. Shirley through performance around Europe, taking her kids with her, and Sue through collaborations like the Postal Art Event, Feministo. Both artists spoke of how they were viewed and how they ended up working away from an art practice for many years after mental and physical exhaustion, financial hardship, or simply lack of support that meant that they could not or did not want to carry on. Well-known artist Bobby Baker has adjusted her whole working method into daily life limited, an organization as her practice, way of finding funding, making work and functioning. And as a disabled woman, this has been really important to her. Nicola Hunter, a working class single mum from Newcastle, who alongside her powerful performance work over the past 20 years, has spoken publicly about being in crisis, being homeless as a single mum. 
hardly the scene that we're offered when imagining the great masters at school or when we enter art schools and universities, but one that Nicola has made powerful work through. The art world is feeling increasing pressure, I hope, to consider the effects of its structures with regard to representation of race, gender and disability. But we also need to include class and assumed class perspectives within this. I interpreted at the WOW Festival in March, and the same issues were obvious to me there too. The speakers were talking about leadership and choice of employment, sticking to principles and standing up for yourself. They talked of gender disparity in corporate office spaces and large organisations. No one was talking about the part-time service level workers, the cleaners like my mum. Those who, because of immigration status, benefit status or poverty, do not have the power to choose whether to work somewhere because of principles, racism or misogyny. I'm not saying that everyone should become artists or work within the art world, or that everyone would even want to. But if we teach and share that there are alternative ways of working, that the idea of a full-time studio artist white, middle class, with financial security in order to exhibit with expensive materials and work for years without fees and funding, is not actually the norm. That the idea of an obsessive artist with no other influences to his oeuvre other than the process is not the only way. That is not only okay to have what is considered as a disjointed practice, but actually this can not only be necessary for survival financially, physically or mentally, but it can actually be beneficial to our practice and the work we produce that by working differently, but also talking openly about this, then, last slide, then we begin to remove the barriers to what we consider the art world. And in doing so, we are not just an echo chamber of ideas and experiences reaffirming one another with our scripts, art language, and ideas of political and social freedom, a freedom gained by privilege and the luxury of time to think. What we see when we explore women artists over the years, especially when including women of colour and working class women, is that they support one another, not competitive, but collaborative, celebrating each other and learning from one another, recognising the need to pay and be paid, and not confining their work, practice and discussions to one specific area of their life. I found out what people who I work with need and also expect to need to make changes. I expect to need to make changes and be flexible and adaptable. I'm still asking for advice and support and researching how to do more and how to do better. This way I access more people, perspectives and experiences within my research. I learn more. It also opens up my projects, I hope, to more people. So this thing called art becomes more open, less exclusive, more relatable to people with different backgrounds than my own or than traditional art audiences and more effective. Because yes, I want my art to be effective. Art is about sharing experience. And if we only ever share the same experiences or the same people's perspectives of those experiences and stories, then how do we ever learn more? How do we properly record our lives if only limited type of life is shared? If we only consider one type of artist the proper way? How do we expand? How do we change? And we do need to change. And dad, I definitely don't have a proper job. I have two quite weird ones, but I love them. <laughs>